world, Dan Brown here, because it's this time of year, once again, the time of year that is to say when they have spoiled every card that's going to be in the next Commander set, but we can't buy that set yet because it's not out yet, so we just have to look at the cards and talk to each other about what we think about the cards. So, my, my purpose for being here today is to help you know what to think when you're looking at the cards and what to say when you're talking to your friends about the cards after you thought about them, specifically with a countdown of the top 12 new multicolored mythic legendary creatures, which is to say creatures that could be your commanders. We're gonna start with my least favorite and then go all the way down to my favorite. There are 12 of them, let's do this. Starting us off at number 12, we have uh, Marisil the Pretender. I'm just like not that enthused about him. He's he's cool, it's a cool-ish idea, but in practice I think it, he will be kind of clunky. I mean, I'm hesitant to say that any commander is bad because any commander can be built around in a way that the deck is still good and I could very well like lose to 12 of these Marisil decks in the next year or so. So I, maybe there's a way to break him. I did see the top comment on the uh, subreddit deck construction thread about him uh, mentioned Anthroplasm and Sage of Hours, which is like, a, it's a cute idea to take infinite turns, but you're sacrificing the utility of having like any other commander capable of grinding out value all game long for what I think is basically a glorified combo piece in that situation. So like if, if you're trying to take infinite turns too, there are more efficient ways to do it. I will say though, at first, I thought that Marisil would be a great combo commander. I was thinking about like cutting out the middleman, i.e. Necrotic Ooze from some Phyrexian Devourer and Triskelion combo shenanigans. Until, that is, I read Marisil's last sentence of text, which says, you may activate each of these abilities only once each turn, which shuts all that fun down. I'm sure there are still some fun ways to capitalize on Marisil, but to my eyes, he looks more like a commander for Rube Goldberg machine combo Johnnies, but not the combo part so much, more than spikes who want to like win games and grind out value. Like to really go deep with Marisil's ability in a non-combo shell, you'd probably need to cast him a few times to put cage counters on a few different things, and you'd probably want a few different ways to untap him to use those abilities like on every opponent's turn, and at, at that point, you're dedicating a lot of card slots to support for something that's like not terrible, but not great. I give Marisil a D plus. At number 11, we have the Ur-Dragon. Ur Daddy here reminds me in a weird way of Radha Heir to Kaid. Kaid? I'm not sure to say that, but I've never built a Radha deck, but I've always been a little bit interested in looking into it because I, the idea of just having a two mana mana dork as your commander, that is to say, available on turn two every single game, it's not a bad starting point for a Gruel deck. Jam your deck full of like the best four drop mid rangey creatures, and yeah, that, that could really go somewhere. In a dragon tribal shell, the Ur Dragon's eminence ability is kind of like having a free mana dork all game long, every single game that you play. Not exactly, but the comparison is there, right? You see what I'm saying? Now, if that's the kind of deck you want to build, my advice is that five drops, the five CMC slot is where dragons start to get really juicy. I know that it's like tempting to just put all of your biggest, craziest, scariest dragons, and maybe that's the deck you want to build and that's the most fun anyway. But if you want to grind out value and like win games through combat, the best way to do that, I think, would be Five drops. Obviously a terrifying commander if he ever hits the table, but at nine mana to start with, if you're gonna run him as your commander, you need to just accept the fact that he might never see play. And if he does see play, you absolutely have to give him haste and preferably like some kind of protection, hexproof for shroud. Big bad that costs too much mana, I'm gonna give it a C plus. At number 10, we have Arabo. Roar of the World. He's another one of these eminent commanders, a cycle of four. I'll talk about the other ones a little later. And let me just say, I, I do like eminence. It reminds me kind of obviously of Aloro. I always thought it was a little weird to just get something for nothing. So tying Aloro's ability to like a, a creature sort of tribal build, that reigns it in a little bit, makes it fair, makes it cool. 
uh, and makes it acceptable to print on four more creatures. Arabo's Eminence ability gives you a free giant growth immediately. I mean, starting turn one, although realistically you're probably not going to be swinging with a green or white creature until turn two, but that's where my brain starts going if I start thinking about what an Arabo deck would look like if I built it. I'd probably do a search for, you know, two CMC or less hashtag value cats. Like if you're swinging in on turn two or turn three with a 5-5, five, five, I don't know, double strike or lifelink, those exist. There's a chance that at least in a three player game, you could put serious pressure on opponents with like kind of a straight aggro deck. I haven't dug too deep into this idea because realistically I'm not going to do it, but if you're interested, I would highly recommend some of these two CMC or less double strikey and or lifelinky cats. Arabo gets uh, a C plus also. At number nine, we have Okagachi Vengeful Kami. Should have known the Kamis were coming to get us. Okagachi kind of fills out something that was missing from the format, and that's a generalist five-color commander that also has flying. Until now, the only other five-color commander with flying uh, has been Scion of the Ur-Dragon, which is a, a decent commander, sure, but it lends itself to a pretty linear dragon tribal build, which, I mean, I guess it's ironic that its less dragon tribal linear focused replacement comes from a precon that is like decidedly dragon tribal, but I digress. Anybody who's been looking to build a deck that has access to every single color, which is to say pretty much every card ever printed, uh, reliably pressure opponents with commander damage in the air or even with just any kind of evasion, and have some upside generally that's not as specific as like dragons, rah, even though Okagachi, I guess, is a dragon. Okagachi's kind of perfect for that. And that upside is pretty cool. It's pretty interesting, like political and stuff. If you can convince your opponents that you would be able to give Okagachi a haste, then it provides you with a lot of influence just sitting there in the command zone. Just scare them about what you might do, but then don't actually have to do it. That, that, that one's free right there, pro tip. B plus. At number eight, we have Inala Archmage Ritualist. Let's start with the bad here. Her second ability, tapping five wizards to make an opponent lose seven life. I mean, I guess it's just pure upside, but cards printed in the past have taught me to expect more when tapping wizards for value. You know, this this is a world with a zombie lady of scrolls and uh, the, the supreme inquisitor. Her eminence ability, though, definitely has me thinking about some ETB triggers stapled to wizards like Archaeomancer, Dual Caster Mage, Trinket Mage, Venser, Shaper Savant, like pretty cool value potential and you could make it a double-double situation if you have a Panharmonicon on the table. She's pretty good. She opens up wizard tribal to more than just mono blue in a pretty serious way. I give her a strong B+. At number seven, we have Mathis Fiend Seeker. I'm kind of a sucker for low CMC commanders because even if you disregard all of the rules text, there's still just a guaranteed way to build a board early. Like, as a general rule, you never want to be the one player without a blocker by the time turns four and five roll around, right? Even if you have to chump with them, if you only have to pay five mana next time and then seven mana the next time, like, that's not usually so bad by the time you've had time to block two or three times. Plus, there's always some kind of upside on these low CMC commanders, right? Ways to grind out value. Mathis's bounty counters are pretty neat, like, not game-breaking by any stretch, but a fun and political way to grind out value without forcing you to build your deck in any, like, hyper-specific, super-linear way, right? Mardu good stuff works here and would probably be a pretty good deck. A minus. At number six, we have Edgar Markov, or as his friends called him in high school, Edmark. Ed here is the only of the four eminent commanders whose like freebie ability actually builds your board with permanent permanence, right? Free tokens are a good thing, and I'm tempted to say that I like Ed's eminence ability better than any other. 
I do hesitate just a little bit though because I have this aversion to most commanders that cost more than five mana, particularly in these naturally aggressive colors, particularly with like a, an incentive to go wide with a combat-based game plan, right? Six converted mana cost just seems a, a little bit pricey. But with Ed, you are getting value for zero mana at all, like doubling your vampire count until you're able to tap out for six. And when you do tap out for six, Ed does have a haste. Like, personally, I'm more excited to build a deck around, like, one of the other vampires from C17. But I understand I'm probably going to lose to more than one Edgar Markov deck this year. Edgar gets uh, an A minus. Crack in the top five, we have Miri, Weatherlight Duelist. Miri is pretty darn good. She's a low converted mana cost commander designed to attack. She's hard to kill in combat. She gives your entire board pseudo menace and she rewards swinging by keeping you like a little bit safe anyway with her silent arbiter type ability. She's, uh, she's a really good commander if like attacking people to death is a valid strategy in your metagame. Miri is a great commander for grinding out value starting in the early turns of the game, and she gets bonus points for not requiring a super, like, specific build. There are, you know, any number of ways you might approach building a Miri deck. I'm giving her an A, just a, a straight A. At number four, we have Kess Dissident Mage. She's not exactly a, a breakthrough for Wizards R&D team. Like her abilities are very simple. They're 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 pretty basic, but she's just she's just good. She flies. She's a 3/4 which makes her great at blocking. She's efficiently costed and getting instants and sorceries back from your graveyard once per turn is great value. Because Kess is so simple, though, you can do pretty much anything you want with her, right? She's just a good stuff Grixis commander. You can go Voltron if you want. I mean, you can go Control in these colors very easily, just using her ability to get instants and sorceries back. What I will say, a bit of advice, don't overlook really simple, I'd say, like, sorceries that draw you cards. Divination is crazy disproportionately good with Kess on the battlefield. And there are a few, you know, different printings they've done of that same exact ability, right? Three mana to draw two cards. Kess gets a super solid A. I will be scared the first time I sit across the table from a Kess player. At number three, we have Nazan Revered Bladesmith. I'm putting Nazan very, very high in the running for Commander 17's most creative card design. This is a super unique commander. The Hammer of Nazan is basically like a, a sub-commander equipment because it's almost always going to be the best equipment for you to tutor for with his ability. So with his hammer, Nazan is an indestructible 7-4 with some tappy evasive stuff and who lets your team suck any new equipment straight onto themselves for no equip cost, which would then give them tappy evasive stuff too. So here's the deck. Just, just go ahead and build this. You'll be fine. You need a Loxodon Warhammer, a fully foiled out like masterpiece set of Swords of the Blank and Blank, and the, some mid-range flying white creatures like Angel Delios, some high-end green tramplers, and about uh, 25 or so like ramp and card draw spells. It's a spicy soup right there. I'm stamping Nazan with an A+. It's just a cool card. At number two, we're really getting to it now. <laughs> I've got Alicia Sanguine Tribune. Man, Alicia is good. Like, deceptively good. She's better than she looks at first. In a linear life gain shell, she can easily become a super fast, super resilient combat threat. Like, if I wasn't so invested in another Mardu deck, I've got my Alicia deck, I, I would be brewing something super seriously here. I mean, yes, eight mana is enormous. That's like a crazy huge amount of mana for your commander. But her cost reduction ability is also pretty crazy efficient. Like, y you do need to get over the hump of casting her for the very first time. That's always going to be kind of the most difficult and maybe the most awkward. But by the time you have like five or six lands on board, you should have enough mid-range, life-gainy things to keep her cost pretty close to just 
you know, three, you know, red, white, black for the rest of the game. To help cast her that first time, though, because I'm so hype on this commander, I actually went and did some advanced magic searches uh, for ways to gain little bursts of life early in the game for just like one or two mana. Uh, Sarah Ascendant is kind of an auto-include, it's just obvious. Um, Elixir of Immortality fits the bill. Ivory Tower is pretty good. Hide and Seek is an interesting split card that I don't think I'd ever seen before. Hide is just nice upside. It's a utility uh, card for dealing with artifacts and enchantments. Seek, though, is the one that can gain you a quick early burst of life. Um, not to mention that it is great at removing like an opponent's combo piece. You only need the card to be CMC 5 uh, for uh, Alicia's cost to be its minimum, at least the first time. Even dorky little lifelinkers like Child of Night might be worth slotting in just to make sure in your opening hand you have some way always to gain life the turn you want to cast Lysia. And as always in non-green decks, you need as many like two CMC or less mana rocks as you can jam in just for consistency. Even on a slow draw, if you do it right, I think you should still be able to consistently get Lysia out by turn like four or five at the latest, and at that point, she'll probably be close to the biggest thing on the battlefield, swinging every turn, getting bigger every turn, and gaining you more and more life every turn. Like, it's, it's juicy. It gets juicy quick. I got a little into the woods on this. I, I even did a search for Mardu cards that turn a high CMC into a benefit, right? Like aura spells like Dragon Breath, Dragon Scales, Dragon Shadow. Hedron Matrix gives her plus eight, plus eight, and on a lifelinker, that is crazy good. And there are a few effects in black, uh, like Sacrifice or Burnt Offering, or even stapled to creatures like Soldevi Adnate, that let you sacrifice a creature and then add black mana to your mana pool equal to its converted mana cost. I could see a, a really weird turn where you have a uh, pumped up Lysia, you swing with her, you gain like 20 life or something, then you sacrifice her to one of those ritual effects, and then recast her for three, still netting basically five mana from that ritual effect. Shenanigans are definitely possible, is all I'm saying. Beyond all that, I guess just uh, play a bunch of removal spells, some mid-range flying lifelinkers, uh, maybe all those swords that you got for your, what I say, the, uh, <laughs> the Nazan deck. Yeah, all those, yeah, those ones, you know, yeah. It's just a, it's a super punchy, resilient, flexible, life gain deck. Ah! really good. You should build this commander. I give Lysia an A++. All right, ladies and gentlemen, hold on to your hats. It's the moment we've all been waiting for. If you've been crossing off these commanders as we go down the list, you know which one this is already. But uh, drumroll please, it's Ramos. Hey! I'm not even going to tell you my Ramos secrets right now because I'm going to build this deck and do a proper deck tech for it at some point in the next, like, ten years. So uh, the letter grade is uh, WWUUBBRRGG+. Plus. If you average all 12 of these new multicolored mythic potential commander, as in legendary creature commanders, uh, you get an A. Wizards of the Coast, I give you an A for new commanders you are putting out into the commander verse. Uh, I think Wizards just gets better every year. They're, uh, they got this, this iterative upcycling thing baked into their corporate culture, leading to an excellent consumer experience. Uh, it's the best game of all time, and it just keeps getting better. Yay! That's my review.